Listen, Talk, Repeat podcast. I'm Wendy Capewell, your Relationship Specialist, and this podcast is all about things relating and affecting relationships. I'll be interviewing guests who are experts in their profession, learning more about what they do and how they help others. In some episodes, I'll be sharing some insights and tips of my own. So settle back and enjoy. Hi, it's Wendy again. And today I've got the real pleasure of uh, introducing Joanna. She says she has 20 years experience in resolving inherited family patterns and is the founder of the Family Imprint Institute and is with an international private practice she has that so this is fascinating I really want to know more Joanna so please tell me and the audience a bit more about yourself I'd be happy to Wendy thanks for having me on the on the podcast Um, so I think I've always been really fascinated by why people do what they do why they choose certain partners why certain habits are so hard to kind of escape from so i've always been reading books about human psychology and what makes any of us do what we do and so it was a real natural sort of follow into work like this and i just feel so privileged to sit with clients and be invited into the intimate aspects of their lives um so it's it's just really a beautiful setup Mm. Fascinating. So it's a family aspect that you're interested in. It's the family dynamics, the family background, what what forms us. Tell us a bit more about that. Well, I'm actually fascinated by how family imprints us, how it shapes, how we show up in the world. Um, And I'm a mom myself. I I have a long-term partnership. We've been together 12 years. And so as you get into sort of long-term relationship mixed with parenting, mixed with, you know, the stressors of life, the, the, the philosophy that I learned is really in action now in my life. And so it's really neat when the rubber meets the road, you know, what that's all about, <laughs> how my um, influence or moods or way I show up with my son is impacting him. Um, you know, how we come back into self-care, self-awareness, self-responsibility to show up as that best mom or partner or even person we can be. And so I've really, I think it's a really a part of, I can't even, I, I, my husband jokes, I can't, we can't even watch a movie together without me picking out the family dynamics and, you know, what I see in the relationships, just even on the screen. And so it's become the way I kind of, the lens I look through, I suppose. Yeah. And I really, I really relate to that because when I work with clients, I always like looking back at their family tree. I'm not generations, but maybe back to grandparents. What was it like? How did they relate? Where did they live? What did they do? Um, what was the relationship like? Um, what happened in their lives? Because it's not just the current, what's current that's going on. It's going back the other generations because that can really impact, you know, what were they, what was their life like? Because every one of us has a different experience of life and when you get two people meeting together (laughs) they're bringing their two different yeah their two different family backgrounds and their experiences together aren't they absolutely you know whenever i have a couple that come and sit down in my office you know they each want to tell me what's wrong with the other person and you know it's like hold on a minute well over 70% of what we bring in to the relationship has to do with our family of origin. So it's really never a, a, a couple issue, or rarely, I should say, rarely a couple issue. And most often it's each other's family dynamics and how they're maybe creating friction as they come together. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, so we've got a lot of synergy here because uh, I think... Um, yeah coming from a similar place even though we're miles apart thousands of miles apart yeah. with you you in canada and i me in the uk so mm-hmm. it's interesting wherever we are in the world we have similar issues that crop up that's it we all come from a mum and dad we're all sort of a part <laughs> of a family and it really shapes us doesn't it just mm-hmm. do you ever get that situation when you ask um somebody and they what, what was it like growing up? And then they say, oh, well, I had a normal, happy life. And then you start talking a bit further and you find something different. 
<laughs> Absolutely. Um, I think what I appreciate most about the approach that I work with is I really don't move into any type of story about what their challenges are, what they might be up against. It's really for me all about family facts. So that tells me everything. So the way they might start with, oh, everything was great. And then I say, okay, tell me about your mom. You know, was she warm and loving? Was she cold and critical? Well, my mom kind of wasn't available much. You know, I was sort of left <laughs> to my own devices. You think, okay. You know, and then that leads to another series of questions because this shapes, well, our mom, of course, is our first love. And this shapes how we love, how we show up in relationship, even how we treat ourselves, that, that fundamental relationship with ourselves. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And when that person is saying, yeah, I had a happy, happy childhood, it, it was normal childhood, in their minds it was because that's all they knew. Of course. What do we have to compare it to when we're five? You know, we don't know how, what's going on in other households. Exactly. Or very rarely, unless you had friends where you'd prefer to be rather than at home, which was my case. Yeah. <laughs> no wonder you do what you do. It's well earned. <laughs> no, yeah, I, yeah, I've got a badge of honour, I think, with the experiences. Mm -hmm. <laughs> of them. But hey, it's, 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 that's what shapes us as people, isn't it? Of course it is. And I think these experiences can be the very seeds of our expansion. You know, so allows you to be more empathetic with your clients or to have different expectations in your current relationships now. Mm, yeah, definitely. So what are the influences on a relationship choice, on, you know, on, on the subconscious level? Mm -hmm. So I like to describe it as I, I often sort of set up a, a silly joke with my clients to say if both of us were to go to a party and maybe there's a hundred eligible bachelors, they're all equally handsome, they all have, you know, great jobs, it's not about any of that surface stuff, why would we be attracted to just one of them? How do we explain that click that happens when we're drawn in to really meeting someone? Well, so much of that has to do with our family imprint. So we might not even know, oh gosh, this guy, I just met him, you know, but he's actually pretty much on the controlling side and, you know, he's quick to anger. We don't know that, but there's part of us, I believe unconsciously, that pulls us into very similar situations where let's say we have a bit of a broken relationship with our dad because he was so authoritarian. Well, we're playing that out again in our relationship. It's kind of like life serving it back up to say, okay, how are you going to kind of roll with it this time? What's it going to look like here? So our relationships often give us this chance to understand ourselves and those, those wounded parts or those parts of us that still have rejection or judgment or, or if there's sticky spots. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so is that what you think of when people go from one abusive relationship to another? Yes, there's something about if we use something as dramatic as an abusive relationship or even a relationship where you keep marrying, let's say, an A-type personality and you feel like life is all on your own. There's something about that love that feels familiar. And so we keep recreating it until we realize, oh no, you know, I'm the common denominator here. It wasn't <laughs> Dick, it wasn't Bob, it wasn't Chris. Oh no, it's me. And so this is where we can get to do our own personal work to see what is it in me that almost needs this, you know, play in my relationship. Mm. Mm. It is interesting, isn't it? Because, you know, I've, I'm sure you've seen it lots of times when it is that we, people are always drawn to the same kind of person and wonder why. Why do I always keep getting drawn to the bad guy? Why do, the bad, why do I get treated so badly? And they don't recognize their part in it, why they're drawn into it, or why they are allowing themselves to be treated in that way and taking responsibility for that part in it, their part in it. That's it. And from a, a compassionate place around, gosh, no wonder this feels familiar. You know, I've, I've you know, cut my mom out of my life or I haven't spoken to my dad in a dozen years. Examples like this, it's almost like what we exclude, we're bound to repeat. And so really looking at that inner place of how we hold our family experience inside of our body so that life doesn't have to be stuck on repeat. 
Yeah, and that's it, isn't it? Stuck on repeat is what happens, definitely. That's yeah. It. And once you get out of that groove, isn't it great? Oh, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Or you see a client who actually moves on from that. I think that's just wonderful, isn't it? When you they recognise what's happened for them and then they feel that they don't have to be in that groove anymore and they are worth a lot more. That's it. That's it. And the ability to really go inside so that there's greater confidence in their own choice when they are ready to love again, they feel like they can trust themselves more in love. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about those um, experiences that we have in our younger lives, how do they show up in our current relationships, do you think? What's your well, thoughts on that? I think a lot of the, it's a very overlooked um, part of the way people understand themselves because it happens before really words come online. You know, so we don't go to our marriage counselor and say, gosh, I had an early separation from my parents mm -hmm. and that's why I don't trust love or I don't trust life. Uh, we don't have conscious memory of it, but it's actually laid down in the body like a blueprint. And so we, in this work, we call it a break in the bond or an interrupted movement. So this can happen in utero. This can happen right at birth. And for the first about you know, three to five years of life, because what we know in brain science is the baby's brain is literally being patterned after their primary caretaker. So in my case, my mom had to go back to work after six weeks, you know, in Canada uh -huh. now we have a one year maternity leave. Well, I know, and I read in Sweden, I believe it is, it's a three years, you know, three years with mom and baby. Uh -huh. And that is really optimal because so much of the infant's brain development is based on, you know, how present she is. Uh -huh. And for many of us, maybe we did have a stay at home mom, but she's overwhelmed with tasks. And trying to be the great mom but it's all about the laundry and the dinners and the cleaning up and not about play and you know as as infants our sense of i'm okay in the world that internal building of safety and attachment comes really from how mom looks into our eyes we know yeah. it's mirror neurons and we're very much really patterned after that like i'm okay and i get that smile from mom that the world is friendly and so many of us didn't have that and it deeply affects our attachment patterns. Mm. And it really shapes how we show up in relationship, how we bond, uh, do we trust love? Do we, are we just waiting for the, you know, it's like we don't really soften into love and we're just a little guarded waiting for it, love to feel like it did, like the body remembers, you know? Yeah. He's not gonna be there for me, so you're not gonna be there for me, husband, even though that the reality might not be that way. And so until we look at that really early experience, it's almost like it's set as our default reference point. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it is not, it's not whether it's, a, it's, it's not whether you, you, you're there as a mom, but really being present, isn't it? It yeah. is that presence, whether or not you're a working mom or you're a mom there being all the time, it is being present in the relationship. That's it. And, you know, for all of those working moms out there, I mean, I'm a working mom too. Uh, I, I kind of turned to a developmental psychologist I really respect. His name is Dr. Gordon Neufeld. And so he says in today's world, of course, there's going to be separations. Yeah. This is the way our society is set up. It's how we re-knit that separation after it happens. So when, as we pick up from daycare, or let's back up even as we drop off, you know, this, this feeling of my heart stays with you, sweetheart, you know, looking them eye to eye. Mommy's coming back at this time. I can't wait to reconnect with you. And when we get back together again, this is what we're going to do. Yeah. You know, even yeah. if it's you're going to help me chop veggies for dinner tonight, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't have to be some grand big thing, but it anchors something in the child for what they can look forward to. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I, I, ha I don't know what it's like with you but over here i'm seeing more and more mothers with their, their children and their babies and they're locked to their phones and they're not making that connection with their child 
And that really bothers me a lot mm. because how is that child ever going to connect? How are they ever going to bond with their, with their mom or their That's dad? True. It's so true. And I'm not sure if you've ever seen this, Wendy. It's called the still face experiment. I'm sure your listeners could even look on YouTube. It's the most ah. popular, a psychological test, I guess, or, or experiment. And, and the, the Coles Notes version of it is they have a little baby, maybe she's 18 months old, sitting in a high chair, and mom is just across from her. And they're relating. Mom's looking into her eyes. She's laughing. But you can see they're very much in love and connected. And then she has a still face, meaning she's still right there, but she doesn't respond when the baby calls out for her. She just kind of blankly looks at her, likely what our face looks like when we're staring at our phone. Yeah. Uh, and the baby moves into distress within, I don't know, 15 seconds. Really? It's actually really hard to watch. I'm sure as the mom in the experiment, it was really hard to do. Um, but but do, do take a look at that. It's, it's remarkable. Will. I will, because the, the one experiment I remember I did during my training was, do you know John Bowlby? And, I do. Okay. Um, he, he's great on attachment, uh, attachment separation and loss. Wow. And he did an exp a, the, strange, uh, the strange situation, you find that on YouTube. Mm -hmm. um, it was all about the attachment of the mother and the child being left with a stranger and how they how they responded and they said they would never do that experiment in these days it was done in the 50s or something right. but it does really that was where they were the foundations here at least of that attachment theory of, yeah um, so yeah it's interesting isn't it i will look that up though that's interesting it's so nice to hear we're coming to understand these very important pieces more and more and hopefully a podcast like yours serves to get the information out there even more so yeah Let's hope so. Mm -hmm. That's what yeah. that's the whole aim, isn't it? To get it. the word out, get people to understand a bit more and help yeah. them because it's not easy being a parent. It's not easy being in a relationship. And that's so many things get in the way sometimes and it it's uh you know, to help people is just understand a bit more or go, why it's not just me or that would help or whatever it is. I just that's how I feel about it and I'm mm -hmm. sure you do too. Just being able to support parents and people in relationships, couples, individuals. Tough. That's it. <laughs> it's tough. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So when we think about maybe long distance relationships, mm. um, what, what are the frustrations that get involved in that, for example, or, you know, yeah, they can be really challenging. Uh, when we don't have that, you know, soft place to land in life, when usually that's what it feels like to come home to a healthy relationship after, you know, being out there in the world and mm -hmm. all the stress we all know all too well. Uh, so I think it puts an extra a strain on love when we're separated by distance. Not to say that it can't be done, but I think we've got to have extra um, uh, commitment around really being relational. So, you know, a great tool like Zoom where we see each other's face mm -hmm. and, you know, I think sometimes we get time zones in the mix and, you know, different schedules and it's almost like these two people are living two independent lives, mm -hmm. but yet together. And so my, if that they were a client of mine, my inquiry would be around why is it again familiar to be in love, but yet at a distance? It's almost like we keep a full hand, you know, stretched out that it's like, sure, you have my heart as long as it doesn't impinge too much on my own independence. And likely on either one or both sides of that couple, you know, there's a, a parent who traveled a lot and who was away a lot. So love and distance almost intersect. They become the, part of what that love imprint is. Yeah, and maybe, as you say, um, travel a lot, but maybe they were just not present and therefore that would make for that distance in the relationship. Yes. So it can be physical or it could be emotional. I wonder, that's yeah. it. And likely that's more common. And it's, maybe especially now you mentioned about the phones and we're on some screen at some point. And I think that's going to have a huge effect on our relational capacity. I think we're already seeing signs of this. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I really feel that. I, I just feel that, that, uh, 
connection, that communication is, is, is becoming more distant and it's becoming less personalized. It's, it's all the written word or yeah, you know, either a text or a message or something. And there isn't any, you can't have intonation. You can't have any kind of feeling in the written word or, and if it is written, it can be, becomes more from the person who reads it. They're the ones that put the meaning to it rather than the person who spoke it. I mean, we always take our own perspective of something that's said, but I think there's more when you see a written word, you know, well, that you put the emphasis when you read it rather than the emphasis being from the person who wrote it. Yes. And this is where all kinds of misunderstandings can come in. It's, it's a big shift than how it used to be. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So when, you know, what is it that causes all these, these upsets and frustrations that happen in a relationship? Why is it we have those frustrations? Well, I think a lot of it comes down to uh, what we needed as a child. So let's say we really needed more love or more approval or more attention. And we, of course, bring that sort of open space in the body into our relationship. And so we unconsciously expect that our spouse should just know how to fill that space. That if I'm really hungry for approval and I need you to tell me I'm doing a good job, but that doesn't even occur to our spouse, I think then that builds a lot of inherent frustration because we're seeking something outside of ourselves that ideally we could be able to give to ourselves. Yes. And that resonates with me right now because I had a client more recently that um, they were frustrated because they didn't feel that they were important to their spouse. They felt that they were, just disregarded and when we explored it and it was just the 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 example they gave gave it was a good example but you know how they give an example but actually let's dig a bit deeper because that example might be something quite small you know you you uh just don't talk to me where when i when i speak you you're distracted by television or something for example Mm -hmm. and when you take that there's something a lot more than that always it's never about it's the, just digging yeah. and digging and when we I explored it more with them it became apparent that they felt that they weren't important to their parent mm-hmm. to their, their their siblings that they and then in their relationships they chose relationships which didn't feed their needs they were abusive relationships so therefore they were always at the bottom of the pile yeah that's and it. Fascinating, isn't it? How that just keeps replaying or keeps replaying. And then it will just show itself in something small, like whenever you come in, you turn on the TV and you don't talk to me. Mm-hmm. But it's deeper than that. It's fascinating. It isn't it? Is. Well, and maybe some of your listeners are thinking, well, how is this possible? Like, why does this keep repeating? And And I love to share the latest science and really how we're recognizing how this kind of imprint goes on, how these relationship patterns from our family pass into our own marriage or long-term relationship. And we know now without a shadow of a doubt that the experiences, even the traumas, the things that are unresolved for our grandparents Mm -hmm. and our parents travel right down through the DNA. So this is something that's really inside of us that sort of um, walks us to that connection that's going to be a familiar pattern. And so when we begin to explore uh, what influences me, what has me be guarded or not trusting love or falling in love too quickly and having lots of emotional needs, Mm. it can go the other way too. When we begin to look at, as you say, building out that family tree, I do the same thing you know, building the inner image for my client so that I know their inner world so that we can really integrate that and it stops being a reference point. So finally somebody gets to un- unstuck the, the repeat button and things can open up from a place of choice. Yeah. Yeah, because that's it. I think um, when you're in that kind of muddle, you can't see why, you can't see the reason, you can't understand um, 
there's just that overwhelm. And I think the first step is, for me, I would say, well, look, if the first thing is awareness, yeah. then you've got an opportunity to make changes. And I know everybody, I, I mean, oh, I want it to change now, but okay, how long have you lived with this? Right. You you're going to change it in just a few weeks. You mm. can you know, take those baby steps one at a time. You've got the awareness. Now you've got the awareness. You can make choices like you just said. Mm. But it does take small steps to do that, doesn't it? Well, I think it's such a part of us, you know, and we can't just snap our fingers and have it changed. Mm. It's not like ripping off a band-aid. It's really about the practice of self-compassion, the looking really at your family experience and your own inner experience from a very big picture thinking. You know, I find myself saying to my clients a lot, okay, let's take about a hundred steps back from, you know, the, the urgency and the, the, the intensity of this, let's say, argument with, within your relationship so we can see what it's really about. Yeah. Let's look at what's behind mom's critical nature or why dad was so withdrawn. Let's try to understand so that we can step out of it being personal. And this is where we can really make some traction towards real positive change. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it is that, isn't it? That just taking those hundred steps back. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's it. Big picture all the way. I know something isn't now. I was just thinking when you were talking, they were saying, We've, we've kind of learned this pattern. It's almost hardwired within us. And you say, go back generations too. Yeah. It, it's, it's almost saying a, client, a, a person putting on themselves, one of our clients saying, I want this to change now. But okay, so could you speak a foreign language in, in two hours? Could you mm. learn to speak it fluently in two hours? <laughs> There's no way. You have to start learning slowly and taking those small steps and those few words. And you would get those words wrong sometimes in the wrong context. And That's there is something about that, isn't there? Because they are impatient. I do get it. Yeah. But it is they get so hard on themselves, don't they? Well, and I think a lot of the times, and, and this can be even tough for me to swallow some days in my own relationship, because of course we're all humans. We're all in this yeah. game together. Um, but I often say to my clients, our partners show up exactly as we need them to it's almost like they guide us towards the live wire that's in our body that might need a little more tender loving care that we didn't even know was still unresolved yeah so it's not so much about i need to decide to get out of this relationship or my spouse has got to stop doing this because it's driving me crazy it's, it's switching that around it's almost okay what does this moment remind me of you know how yeah. old do i feel and sometimes it's like, oh my gosh, I'm channeling my inner teenager and I've just got my heels dug in, but it's not about that at all. Yeah. Let me really see what this is about so that we don't go down that repetitive cycle. You know, I'm sure many of your listeners can identify with, I am so tired of that same argument. I just don't yeah. want to go down that road again. And so when we can, again, move some into the big picture, something outside of the patterned way can kind of rise up yes mm. and again i was reminded of something else that is so true and i was reminded of uh, someone else and um going back to their childhood you know talking about that and saying that was how did that little girl feel mm -hmm. and she said well she, I, yeah she would have been upset but i should have got over it and I was, hold on a minute mm -hmm. can you just stop you Think about that four-year-old. You're thinking as the four-year-old in your head as an adult. Right. You need to go back mm -hmm. and really think that four-year-old hadn't developed that adult brain. Of course. And therefore, you can't start to say, well, that child and dismiss it or, or, mm -hmm. or not even connect with it. In your adult brain, you've got to go back to thinking about even think about somebody you know who's four years old or of that similar age and then you know just think how that might be for that child you know that child what was it like because you were that age and then they start to see that because they're thinking their adult brain well when i was four but they're actually thinking of the four-year-old in the in the present time and That's it doesn't true. help does it 
Well, I think as adults, we can easily forget that as a child, we didn't have a choice to say, this environment is crazy. Like I'm moving, you know, a little five-year-old with a tiny little suitcase and I'm out of here. And so there's a inherent helplessness around this is my environment and what do I need to do to survive it in some cases. And we begin to compromise and even uh, compartmentalize parts of ourselves in yeah. order to do that through. And sometimes that's what the adult, you know, really having compassion for that younger child self, it needs to really look at. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And I think we learn our defenses as, as children. Oh. That's how we learn to cope in the world. We, we put on some kind of armor to protect ourselves. And people, you know, well, have you ever heard that I've had it said to me, don't be so defensive? Mm. And that phrase is said as though it's something really awful. But actually, I developed my defences for a reason. They protected me. Yeah. They kept me safe. Mm -hmm. They still do it on occasions. At least I can say to myself, okay, I've got to know my defences now. I'm, I'm, they're my friend. And now I just need to question at times, am I using it at this point to the best advantage yeah. or not? But instead of being so afraid of defences, being in contact with them and, and, and knowing them and knowing why we use them. You know, when you I get love somebody, what you're saying. Oh, sorry to interrupt. I love okay. what you're saying there in that to really make friends with our defenses or to get to know them so mm. that we're not stuck in time. We're not using the five-year-old defenses in our 40s but we respect that those defenses needed to be there. So we kind of update them. So they're there for us if, if we need to draw upon them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. As somebody, if they get really angry or they appear arrogant or, you know, I just, I stop sometimes and think, I wonder what's behind that because that's the facade they're wearing to protect themselves. What do they need to protect themselves from? That's it. So, yeah. yeah. And when you, I just think, just befriend your defenses. I completely agree. You know, even get curious about them. Mm. And, and I love to be that way with others. Like, she's like, I wonder what happened to this person that has them show up with such defenses, with such anger, mm. so that you know, I'm not in a judgment mode that allows me to really stay neutral. You know, the less I think in judgment or in argument we can be with what's happening in the world or with what's in front of us, the easier life can really unfold. Yeah, I think so. And when we get upset by what somebody says, it's not necessarily what they said. It's the way we perceived it. And why do I feel like this? Why am I taking this on? What is it triggered in me? Because that person, they may have said something quite innocuous. Mm -hmm. board and it's suddenly, I'm so annoyed that person who behaved in that way. How dare they? <laughs> and why have they said that? And you think, hang on a minute, just take a step back. Where did that message come from in the first place? What has that, what's that knee-jerk reaction that you're experiencing? Yeah. I think it really acts as even a preventative measure for keeping our relationships kind of clean, that we're not so reactive with each other, um, and so that we don't make meanings. I mean, as human beings, we're meaning-making machines, and how do we just let that be over there with the other person? You know, maybe their mood or they're having a bad day, and yeah. we don't have to engage with it and make a yeah. meaning out of it. Yeah, so many people say um, when someone, they're, they're in conflict with, a, with someone, what have I done wrong? Whereas actually, mm. they probably haven't. It's just that person's stuff and it's like, okay, that's your stuff. Yeah. Um, I don't need to carry it around. I don't that's need it. to take it on board. Leave but it I think that. that's because the person who's saying, what have I done wrong? That goes back to their childhood and their family experiences. Oh course and imagine the vigilance that would be needed for a child who let's say has a dad who gets angry at the drop of a hat or a mom who kind of is pretty volatile yeah. and so to think that if we go back to that little four-year-old it's like oh what have I done you know am I in trouble and so yeah. we, we carry that part of ourselves into work with us you know if our husband gets angry oh we don't even you know, look towards resolution, we just tuck in and, and the what have I done kind of overshadows what would be more of a grown-up natural response. 
Yeah, and can I share something at this point of my personal life? Is that okay? So I remember several years ago, I was um, in an office, I was working in an office, and my boss was outside, and he was in the general office, and he was slamming and banging filing cabinets. And what happened for me was I started shaking inside, and I was feeling really uncomfortable sensing that he what have i done wrong this is me i've done he can't find something and therefore he's angry and it must be my fault and i stopped for a moment i thought what's this about mm-hmm. but this is my dad when i was a child mm-hmm. this was what happened when i was a child my dad would get angry i would start feeling upset and and quaking inside mm-hmm. and what have i done wrong and so I stopped at that point. I thought, no, this isn't. I'm not that child. He's not, my boss is not my dad. I don't need to feel like this. So I sat there for probably about half an hour. And then I just went into his office and said, as an adult, um, were you looking for something? Can I help you? Mm-hmm. That's great. And so many of us, if we could just sort of come home to ourselves you know, engage our breath, sort of really, what does this remind me of? Where am I in space and time with this? Mm. So that, that little girl inside of us who's, who's, you know, so scared feels really acknowledged and heard and even held by the breath. And so what a beautiful yeah. practice. You just spent 30 minutes with yourself kind of regulating what was firing off inside. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it was that awareness and it was that feeling, actually, I don't need to react I'm not that child anymore. I could, I could calm the child within me. Mm -hmm. I could empathize with her and say, it's okay. It's not your fault. It's nothing to do with you. And, and then just go to him in an adult mood and say, you know, what was the problem? Which Mm -hmm. made him look pretty stupid because I said, well, if you were looking for something, you only had to ask. Yes. And we would have helped you find it. But instead of being overreacting and him, yeah, having his drop, his teenage drop, um, yeah, it turned it right the way round. And it just is that, oh gosh, what's going on? But actually, no, I don't have to respond. And it, it, it was really, that. I just wanted to share that because it, that was quite a big one for me. Well, I love that. It almost gives this image to me of how many of us out there in life, you know, maybe it was his seven-year-old who was having a bit of a temper tantrum, you know, slamming those doors and it's your little girl. And so how much of all of our little children are inside as we interact in this, you know, pretty complex world and how do we have more self-compassion before moving out into how we all interact with each other? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it is that, I think that's the most difficult part quite often for people to have that self-compassion. Yes. So hard on themselves. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Self-compassion and sort of the practice of it often bumps up against what we hold inside. You know, there's so many people that just want to keep it down, whatever those painful experiences were. So it just feels so big and so scary. But the beautiful story that you shared, Wendy, sometimes it's just as as easy. We all have access to our breath. It doesn't cost a dime. And so we just have to have that self-awareness to give ourselves the gift of that half an hour to really settle back in um, so that we can process it. This is really how we unburden how much the body is holding and what's in that, you know, proverbial Pandora's box of emotion. Yeah. If if we don't feel it, I've really learned our bodies carry the burden. And don't they just, and then they manifest, uh, um, it manifests itself in a, in a physical way with illness and um, disabilities and issues. And I I had one client and she really, she had lots and lots of physical problems. Mm. And uh, I said to her, when we talked and I said, what happened in your life? And she, she talked about one trauma after another that she'd experienced, but she'd never actually dealt with them and I said to her your body is manifesting itself it's it's coming out in you what those traumas that were never never resolved yeah that's it and that is really the essence of healing how do we give ourselves enough time 
and, and understanding, and sometimes it really is, um, cultivating a meditation practice, really mm -hmm. pulling traction away from the negative and what if thinking, and how do I move into a gratitude practice? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's, there's a lot, isn't there? I think sometimes people don't recognize that we are holistic, that our, our emotions, our, our mental state, and our bodies are connected. You can't disconnect them. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, it's neat to see how medical science is finally catching up. We know without a doubt that if we're stressed, our immune system goes right down, you know, psychoimmunology. Yeah. It, it's, it's, it's now a whole area of study. Um, mm. If we're chronically in a job we don't like, that leads to depression. There are all of these sort of things that we can put together and very much our lifestyle choices and the way that we think and feel, it's all so interconnected. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, um, yeah, I think science is unraveling a lot of it and revealing a lot and making it clearer. And I think it's quite incredible. Um, and I just hope that people take it on board a bit, you know, when they say, oh, well, I'm feeling so stressed. And well, hold on a minute. What, what's going on for you? What, what is going on? What, what are you doing? What, what's happening in your life? How can you change it? Um, mm -hmm. Because yeah, that, that I don't think people recognize how much stress impacts on the body long term. So true. It's like a build up residual effect. And, you know, sometimes a simple movement could just be what could I give for my to myself before going out there to give to others? How do I fill my cup first before my full day is about other people's mm -hmm. cup? You know, yeah. and so we step back into the driver's seat by just deciding what is it that I can give to me? What is it that I need to, you know, have a little bit of resilience with, with all that I've got on my plate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because that definitely impacts on the relationships around us. Cause if we don't feel good, we can't give to others. As you said that if we're going around with that half empty cup or even less, then we can't be there. We can't fill other people's cups. And in fact, they'll walk around with empty cups too as a result mm -hmm. of it, which then really doesn't do good for relationships. No, it's downward from there, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, definitely. Is there anything else you want to say that we haven't covered? I, know we, I think we could chat for ages and then it's been really, really interesting. And I know we've taken lots of different turns, but is there anything really burning that we haven't covered, Joanna? Well, I think something that I'd love for your audience to keep in mind is I think we're in a time where we can open up the newspaper or turn on the news and it's so quick to move to overwhelm and, oh my gosh, what's happening here and what could I do? And I think that when we get a little bit of time with our own self-practice, you know, I'll, I'll lean into Mother Teresa's quote, you know, go home and love your family. When there's something that feels overwhelming and too big in the world, what can you do? Well, we can love ourselves, and that's a big enough process right there, and use that, um, that kindness, that generosity, that love, that connection to bring that home to your family. Um, and I think that internal shift, think of if many people took that on, what a ripple effect that could have. Absolutely. Yeah. I so agree with you. I think sometimes people get really as you say overwhelmed and despair about the news outside and it frightens them and they get anxious and they take that into their relationships instead of saying do you know what let's make our world our, our little world in our relationship let's make that good and yeah. once we do that if everybody did that just that kindness generosity and warmth we mm -hmm. could spread that instead of the hatred that is unfortunately around us that's it. Discourse. You know, it's like if these emotions are contagious, instead of more fear, more anxiousness, more judgment, what if we had more tolerance, more acceptance, oh. more agreement? And I think we each have a choice every day. And I know some mornings, you know, it's a hard choice for me to choose. I want to sleep longer and I don't want to do this versus what do I need to do to shift gears here? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think that is it. We, you know, when people talk about world peace, Oh, oh, how can we ever create world peace? We can because our world is our little world. And if we can bring that peace to our little world, then it, as you say, those small steps, it will have a ripple effect. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, I've loved talking to you today, Joanna. It's been fascinating. Yes. And um, I just want to ask, how can people get in touch with you? Great. Well, thanks, Wendy. Uh, my website is www.joannalynn.ca. Uh, because my name is unique, I'll just quickly spell it so that your yes, listeners can find me. Uh, so www.joannalynn.ca because I'm over here in Canada. Great. All the details will be in the show notes for anybody who wants to look it up on the, on the podcast website. Um, uh, but yeah, thank you for that contact mm -hmm. and details. I've loved talking to you and it's been fascinating. I've learned more different ways of approaches and we've shared different things. We've got a synergy, but there's also different ways in which we approach things as well, which I love because I'm learning something all the time and I hope our listeners have learned something today too. So thank you mm -hmm. so much. Well, thanks for having me, Wendy. It's so great to connect with a like-minded person, even as far away ge geographically <laughs> as we are. So thank you for having me on your show. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you. So you can find all the information about this show in the show notes. And you can find lots more on my website, www.yourrelationshipspecialist.co.uk including the link to my podcast, and you can also sign up for my newsletter, which has lots more tips and offers. So until next time, bye for now.